Animal Crossing Church. How are you doing? Hey, yeah, come on. How are you doing? <laughs> it is so good to see you. I want to welcome everyone that's uh, a part of all of this church network we call The Crossing. It's so awesome to be part of a network of, network of churches that are just doing incredible things for God. And I, I got to share an incredible thing that all of us together, we did it together. Uh, last year, about this time, we uh, launched something called XM, Extreme Makeover. And this week, we went over a million dollars. That's a, I mean, think about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a big deal. I mean, that, I don't know. Is that a lot? How many is that a lot of money to? Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, if you won a million dollars, that'd be like, you'd be, would you throw a party? Yeah, we should probably throw a party. I don't know, but that was, that's a third of the way, just a little, just, just close to a third of the way of what uh, we pledged. And we're one year into uh, XM. And, you know, we're going to be sending out something to show you all of the projects that have been completed and the ones that are in the process of being completed. And I just want to hone in on one. So, so all, all locations, guys, it, it's awesome to see what the people of God can do when they allow the Holy Spirit to work in and among them. And that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Uh, that, that is a real expression of faith. Uh, in your giving over and above your regular uh, tithing. That's just awesome. But here's one thing I want to hone in on, and that is Hannibal. Okay, everybody in Hannibal, scream right now. Uh, yeah, you're not in Hannibal right now. Uh, there's going to be something awesome uh, happen in Hannibal. Uh, I want to show you a couple of pictures of a location, okay? You're going to see a location because Hannibal was part of XM. So you look up there, that's the Orpheum Theater. It was built in 1922, okay? Uh, that's what it looks like inside, okay? It's got like 965 seats in there. And uh, it hasn't been used since 2003. Hannibal LaGrange College was using it then. They built a new uh, a brand new theater for performing arts. And uh, uh, the people of Hannibal have been praying for God to provide a location. They've been in the YMCA, and uh, they've been running over 300 in the YMCA. Uh, they're talking about having to go to two services. And we believe that God can provide them through us a facility, a, a place, a home base where they can do ministry. And that's what that is. That's what the Orpheum Theater is going to, going to become. It's going to become a place where, where God's light goes out into that community like never before. Now, I, I haven't gotten the tally yet of how much has been pledged by the people in that brand new church. They're only like five months old. And uh, the leaders, just the 13 families that represent leaders in that church have pledged $100,000 over three years. And and uh, the rest of them have been going through that process of pledging too. And I think they're going to pledge enough to actually pay for those buildings. What I want the rest of the crossing to do is to start praying about, and this is as part of your XM. So, you know, some of you have been doing great. Some of you have maybe fallen back a little bit. You know, it's been the summertime. You need to get back into it. Here's what I want you to consider doing. I want you to consider for your XM, so like if you pledge $10,000 or $5,000 to XM, this would apply to whatever you pledged. But to designate that, we want to do this in one offering that's going to happen on the 22nd and 23rd of this month, October. One offering for XM, and what we'd like to do is put enough money that, of our XM money to just take care of it. Because there's enough there to do that in that XM budget. And if you'll designate that, they'll be able to get into that building. And uh, we'll be able to start that work right away. And they'll have a home. They'll have a location where ministry can go out and the light of Jesus can go out like never before. I want you to pray about that. I want you to hear what the Lord has to say, not what I have to say. And we'll keep you up to date and be thinking about the 22nd, 23rd. Of, uh, of October because we're going to do what we did at 920, for 929. We're going to see if God will just show up, if people's hearts will be stirred. I'm not going to do that. That's not my part. That's his part. But if, if you'll just pray, he will raise up what needs to be raised up. So I want you to be thinking about that. You know what? We can do awesome things 
when we respond to God. Maybe better said would be God does awesome things when we give him a chance, when we get out of his way and we let him do it. And what I want to talk about in this next series uh, that we are calling Live Strong, you saw that up there, Live Strong, is is what do we want to do? What's winning for us when it comes to our relationship with God and our relationship with the rest of the world? You know, God wants you to live strong. He wants you to play a part in how He shapes eternity. Isn't that an awesome thought? He wants you to play a part in how He shapes eternity. There are going to be people that are going to spend eternity in heaven with God and with Jesus Christ because God used you in their lives. You're shaping eternity. You are making eternity look like what it's looking like in cooperation with God. He has got a great plan for you. And that's the win for you to discover it and live in it. We have to live in a way in order to receive the abundant life that God has promised to us. And the person that I want to use as an example for this through this, these next weeks together in this Live Strong series is a man named Joshua. Now, some of you have heard of a man named Joshua in the Old Testament. Some of you may not have. So let me just give you a quick background into Joshua, okay? Joshua was one of the slaves that came out of Egypt when Moses, the deliverer, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. You remember the stories? Uh, uh, there were plagues, and Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, this king of Egypt. And, and, uh, uh, and, but there were all these plagues that, that motivated him to let him go. And God, you know, parted the Red Sea. They went across. He closed it up. He destroyed the Egyptian army. Well, there was a young man that was part of those two million Israelites, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua was someone who uh, God put into close proximity with Moses. And so Moses began to pour discipler into disciple He began to pour into this young man, Joshua. Now, Joshua didn't have an easy life. It didn't take a long time for those two million Israelites to get from Egypt to the land that God promised. Didn't take very long at all. And once they got there, it says that Moses sent out 12 spies to spy out the land. And when he did that, he, he chose those 12 spies. One of those 12 spies was this young man named Joshua. And when they came back, 10 of the spies were uh, totally discouraged by what they saw because they saw uh, these fortified cities and they saw what they called giants in the land and they were afraid. They were afraid of being destroyed by, by this occupied country that they were supposed to inhabit. But there were two that had a different opinion and one of those two was Joshua. Joshua said, God has given us this land and, and we should take it. Because God's going to go before us. But you know what? The children of Israel didn't listen to Joshua. They didn't listen to his report and, and Caleb's report. They listened to the report of the ten. They got discouraged. And they didn't have faith in God that God could lead them to take uh, that land that he had promised them. Because of that, God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, I want you to see this from Joshua's point of view. Did Joshua do the right thing or the wrong thing? He did the right thing, but because the majority of the people chose to not have faith in God, he got caught up in that. I mean, he, was, uh, he, you know, he wanted to go out there and take the land for God, but the rest of the people didn't. And so because of that, he had to be in that 40 years, 40 years of wandering. You imagine seeing your life just ebb away, just be poured out, all of these important years of your life, and you can't use them for God the way you want to, the way you feel like God's called you to because other people did stuff that wasn't right. You don't hear about Joshua getting discouraged. You don't hear about him giving up. And he puts up with that and did a lot of waiting and suffered a lot of disappointment for 40 years. But you know that whole 40 years, Moses was pouring into him. Moses was taking that relationship that had been uh, gone through the fire with God and he was pouring that relationship into Joshua. And I want to pick up right at the very end of Moses' life, okay? And we read about this. We're going to be in about three 
pages of the Bible. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there and we'll just stay right in that general area. Joshua 1 will be there and then we're going to be back in Deuteronomy like 31 and, and 32. So, uh, and they're like, that's the very end of Deuteronomy, the beginning of Joshua. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 23. Deuteronomy 31, 23. This is what Moses says to Joshua. It says, he commissioned, this is verse 23, he commissioned, commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So Moses is saying, listen, you're going to be the guy. I'm not going to be the guy to lead the, this nation into the promised land. You're going to be the guy. And I would imagine that that was a pretty powerful statement to Joshua. You mean it's going to be me? And me? Moses wrote this song. This song that just praised and, and exalted and uh, extolled the Lord. And you read that song in, in chapter 32 all of chapter 30, almost all of chapter 32 is that song. And you get to the end of the song in verse 44, Deuteronomy 32, 44, it says this, Then Moses came and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he with, the, with Joshua, the son of Nun. That means all the children of Israel are out there, and they're uh, next to the, the Jordan River, and they're all out there in this huge crowd. And here's Moses... And here's Joshua. So everybody, all these two million Israelites are looking at Moses and they're going, okay, there's Moses. He's 120. And there's Joshua. There's the next guy that's going to lead us. So Moses is making it very clear that this is the next guy. This is the heir apparent. This is the guy who's going to lead you into the promised land. Now I want us to have that in our mind when we go to Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1 through 9. Okay, let's just hear the word of the Lord. It says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea, toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, in verse 2, it says a really profound statement. It says, Moses is dead. I want you to think about that. We know for at least 40 years, and probably for longer than that, Joshua has been living in the shadow of Moses. Moses has been poured in Joshua, into, into Joshua, but what has Joshua seen? What has Joshua experienced? Did Joshua experience the ten plagues? Did he see the ten plagues with his own eyes come down on the, on the uh, children of Egypt? Did he see that? Did he see God become a pillar of fire? Did he see that? Did he see God in the Shekinah glory, the cloud of the Lord? Did he see that? 
Did he see manna come down from heaven? Did he see the quail? Did he see the water come from the rock? Did he see the the Red Sea part and all the people go across on dry land? He'd seen a lot, right? And who was at the front of all of that? Moses was. And I would imagine, you know, even though Joshua may have had some idea about someday being a great leader, maybe God had put that into his heart, I don't know, it was probably a little comfortable to be in the shadow of Moses. Are you hearing, are you getting that? And so it's like, you know, I'm with him. Moses has the staff. You know, Moses has the relationship with God. Moses speaks with God as a man speaks to man, like face to face. I mean, that's not me. That, that's Moses. You know, Moses is cool. And then all of a sudden, Moses is dead. So I don't get to hide in his shadow anymore. All of a sudden, it's me. Feel the weight of that. Can I look up at the sky and make it rain bread? Can I strike a rock and make water come out of it for two million people and their flocks and herds? Can I speak to the sky and the water parts and people? Can I do any of that? Man, would that be scary? Would that be like crazy scary? Really, it would, wouldn't it? I mean, Moses was more of a legend than he was a man. And I would imagine in his human heart, he would, go, he would have thought, I can't do that. What's going on here? And I'm going to tell you what's going on, is that we experience God and our faith grows as we move into a crisis of belief. Your faith is never going to grow unless it is in a place where it's forced to grow, where it has to grow. And God will put you in that place. He'll put you in a place where you need to make a choice. And the choice that you make to be successful in that choice for God, it's going to require you to do something that you cannot accomplish by yourself. You're going to have to cooperate with God. It's not something you can do alone. And the decision that you make in that moment is going to determine what you really believe about God. And that's where your faith either grows or gets stuck. So that's where Joshua is. He's in a crisis of belief, all right? It's always been Moses, and you've been his number two guy. You've been his first officer, but now it's you. You're the captain of this ship. You're the one that's going to have to take him in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lead these people through you. You ever been in a crisis of belief? You ever experienced that? You might be in one right now. You might be experiencing a crisis of belief right at this moment. Moses had plenty of those. And I remember the first big one that the Bible talks about. It involved a bush that burned and wasn't consumed. Now, you know what? I don't imagine that Joshua is thinking about this at this particular moment in his life when God's calling him to do it. But when Moses had his first crisis of belief, how well did he do? Okay, Moses, you're going to go back to Egypt, and you're going to say, let my people go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's going to let the people go because I'm going to show myself uh, to the nation of Egypt. And what, how did Moses respond? How did he do in his crisis of belief? Oh, I, uh, 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 I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Who made your mouth, Moses? That's what God said. Finally, Moses said, send somebody else. He basically said, no. And God said, you know what? I'm, I'm not taking that answer. You're, you're going to go do this. How reluctant in the crisis of belief was Moses? Now, when Joshua's looking at Moses, he's looking at a 120-year-old man that God has been honing in the fire. And, and look what's happened to him. I mean, he's become this mountain of a man. But Joshua, you know, he, this is at the beginning of God using him pretty much. And I'm thinking he's doing pretty well with this crisis of belief. You don't hear Joshua back away. You know, your faith was designed to grow this way. It is designed to be built in a crisis of belief. And I want you to think about this right now. Whatever campus you're on, what is going on right now in your life? You know what? Right now, your crisis of belief 
may be, when am I going to step over the line for Jesus Christ? When am I going to accept him? When is he going to become my Savior, my Lord? Your crisis of belief may be happening right now. And, and right now, you're fighting with it. Now, it's not what I'm saying. It's whatever God's saying in your heart. Your crisis of belief might be getting in an intentional relationship with somebody or a, a, a few people and, and allowing yourself to be poured into or pouring into someone else. And you're kind of going, I don't know if I really want to do that. That might be your crisis of belief right now. There may be an issue in your life that you have negotiated with, at least in your own mind. You've written yourself a permission slip, and you're going, it's okay for me to be this way. And God's going, really? It's not. And in order for you to quit that behavior, you're going to have to burn some bridges. And God's pointing those out to you in your heart right now. And you're facing a crisis of belief because you don't really want to light them on fire. What may be going on in your life, I don't know, but God works in the crisis of belief. And you know what he says? He says, be strong and courageous because I'm going to do this in you. It's not you. It's me doing it in you. So if you're struggling with that decision right now, I want you to know that. I want you to take some courage because it's not you. It's God working in you and you cooperating with that. See, that's where Joshua is. He's living strong because he's cooperating with God. Second thing I want us to see is is what he says in verse 7 and 8. If you look at 7 and 8, it, it says, Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right or the left. It goes on to say, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do all that's written in it. You see that? Now, we don't really think what that's saying. We don't really understand what that's saying. So if I say, hey, you you need to meditate on the Word of God day and night, you may understand what that means to you, but I want you to see what it meant to Joshua, okay? First of all, the Word of God... In that moment in Joshua's life is how many books? Five. There are only five. Okay, right? And guess what? If you go back to, Deuter- back to that, about a page over to Deuteronomy, the ink isn't even dry on the book. I mean, Moses has actually just finished writing it. And then he gives it uh, to the Levites, and then he goes up on Mount Nebo and dies. So he's saying, I want you to read... I want you to meditate day and night on this book. I want you to live according to this book. I want you to have this book in your mouth. I want you to be all about this book. Here's another deal you may not have thought about. Joshua was a principal character in four of those five books. I mean, he's going, why do I need to read this book? I lived it. Why do I need to read about all these stories? I'm like a character. I mean, like I'm one of the guys that actually walked through the Red Sea. Come on. Do I really need to do that? Think about Joshua's life. You know, you might be going right now. You might be going, you know what? I need to, I need to, I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands because I'm not going to embarrass you. But I bet just about every one of you that bothers to call yourself a Christian would say, I need to be in God's word more. I need to read the Bible more. I know I should read the Bible more. I should have some time that I read the Bible more than I do. All right. But I'm busy. You know, you don't understand. I'm busy. I've got a life. I got this. I got that. I got a lot of things I got to do. And it's just really hard to, 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 to carve out that time in my life for God's word, right? And you know, you might have some really good reasons for that. You may be a really busy person. Any of you running a nation? Just asking. Any of you got about 2 million people that are waiting on your next decision? Was Okay, so I'm just saying, was Joshua busy? So what is God saying? He's going, I want you to meditate on my word day and night. Don't you think Joshua could have said, well, you know, I hear you, God, but I'm busy. I'm sorry. You gave me this nation. I'm trying to run it. Boy, does that sound like you? Does that sound like me? I want you to capture this now, okay? Because to be strong and courageous... To be strong and courageous, you'd have to go through a crisis of belief. That was point number one. To be strong and courageous, you have to have a foundation in the Word of God. 
because you can't do this. You can't do the horizontal. You can't be in relationship with other people. You can't run a business right. You can't be a decent teacher. You can't do any of this stuff right and honor the Lord unless this is right. Are you guys, uh, like Christians, are you broken or can you say amen? You can't do this unless, you cannot do that unless this is right. And a lot of us keep trying to do this without having this right. And, and you're burning out and you're getting discouraged and you're depressed and you're disillusioned and you wonder why. It's because you have unplugged yourself from the power source. This has to be right first and then this can be right. God's saying, listen, you're not running this country. You're not leading this people. These are not your people. They're my people. I'm leading this people. I'm bringing them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. I'm doing all that. Your responsibility is to be in alignment with me and then allow me to work through you. You just cooperate with me. I'll do the work. Boy, what would it be like if we could get that right? Be strong and courageous. Be in the Word. Because when you get in the Word, God will reveal Himself to you. So, be strong and courageous in the crisis of belief. Be strong and courageous by having a foundation in the Word. Be strong and courageous because you have an all-powerful companion. You have an all-powerful companion. I want you to think about that, because right now, some of us are probably going, i got to rearrange all this. I'm I'm struggling with this. You you have an all-powerful companion. An all-powerful companion. Look at what he says in verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. I'm here. It's going to be all right. Is that hopeful? Is that encouraging? And you know what it is? The whole point. (laughs) That's the whole point. It's really not leading a people from one location, real estate, to another location of real estate. The point is, they're the people of God, and he wants them to be with him. That's it. He wants the people to be with him. God loves you. He loves you. Did you hear that or not? God loves you, and he is drawing you to himself. And that's what he's doing to the people here. And he's using Joshua as an instrument to draw his people to himself. And God is going to use you to draw his people to to himself. He's doing it with a crisis of belief and a foundation in the word of God, but ultimately it is all about being in an intimate, personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And he says, don't be afraid. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like Jesus. I remember last week I was talking about that. Remember? Remember? The three words that Jesus did say, the three important words that he didn't say, I love you, he chose to demonstrate instead of say. But the three words he did say that are so important are don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he said what? All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Now go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and I, what? I what? Will what? I'll be with you. Always. Even to the very end of the age, to the end of time itself, I'll be with you. We have an all-powerful companion. Do you know what? That's your call. 
You know, some of you right now may be disconnected from this story, this Live Strong story, because, because you're going, no, that was Joshua's call. I mean, Joshua's talking to God. God, I, God, you know, he's hearing God. God's saying this to Joshua. Joshua's doing this thing. I'm not, I haven't, God hasn't told me to deliver a nation. No, but he did tell you Matthew 28. He did tell you that. That's your call. And you know what? Right now, you may be at the beginning of your journey. And it's time to say, I want you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Or maybe you're down the road a little bit in your journey. Maybe something has you stuck, you know. You're just stuck in something. And it's time in that crisis of belief to say, you know what, my relationship with Jesus is more important than this. God, help me. Help me. Show me. Move me. Change me. And in the crisis of belief, he will. Maybe you're trying to control it yourself rather than realize it's God's agenda, not yours. And you just need to cooperate with his agenda. Maybe, maybe that's got you out of the word and you're not experiencing that solid foundation that the word gives you. Maybe you're struggling keeping the vertical right and you're trying to do it all in your own strength and your own power. You know what God wants? He wants you to live strong. We're moving to a time of decision.